Okay, so I'm Brian Zog. I think I know everybody pretty much in here. Um, I just joined the Cornea faculty in July. Um, finished my fellowship and residency here. Um, so we're going to be talking mostly about cornea, and if we have a little bit of time, we'll talk a little bit about refractive surgery as well. Um, so we're going to start out with our two cornea fellows. So Brent Betts is going to start. He's going to talk about acanth amoeba keratitis. He comes to us from Wake Forest. And he's going to be joining a private practice up in Boise um, at Intermountain. It's kind of the name of the main practice up there that he'll be helping us out with for our northern cornea. So we'll start with Brent, and then we'll move to Severin. And Severin Poli comes to us from UT Southwestern, where he did his residency. And he's going to be joining Grant Morchetti in private practice in Arkansas, one of our past glaucoma fellows in residence. So we'll go to that point for now. So this is kind of a follow-up to, we already talked about Canton the last time Dr. Uh, Severin did, and just kind of the general management ideas and kind of updates on treatment. But I just wanted to show, mainly I'm going to show a surgical video, kind of the what ultimately can happen to these acanthamy patients. Um, so I'll do, I don't have a PowerPoint, but I'll just kind of give a little clinical history. It's a, it's a patient we saw starting in September 2015. He had already been treated for a month for kind of an unusual keratitis, history of contact lens where he had had hyperopic LASIK about 10 years previously. So, the, you know, kind of had like a suspicious viral appearance. So he was started on acyclovir. He kept, was on a fourth generation fluoroquinolone and just didn't really improve. And he was seen over multiple weeks. And uh, he was, he had a scraping done about two weeks after we saw him. Finally, at, at a month, it came back positive for canthamoeba. So he was put on PHMB and chlorhexidine, which is kind of our standard treatment. And over the next six months, he kind of waxed and wane. He had a really persistent ongoing epithelial defect. Um, but about in the springtime, we had got him down to just using both chlorhexidine and PHMB just twice a day. And then he got a lot worse. And he developed a huge hypopian. And we were really, because of the rapid onset and just the appearance, it really looked fungal. So he's taking the OR for AC washout, and the washout, uh, the hypopian didn't grow anything. And about six days later, his cornea just blew up again. And so he was taking the OR for emergent PK. In general, if you suspect canthamoeba, the stand treatment is not to do an emergent PK because it can recur in the graft really quickly. The cyst, um, the, the canthamoeba bugs can get right, right back in the graft and you get a worse uh, inflammatory reaction. But it really looked fungal, so he had a, this emergent PK, and there was pus everywhere, and it was he kind of had a mushy host cornea, so they had to do a conch flap in one area. And anyways, it came back as a camp amoeba. So that was in April, and then we nursed him through the summer and up until two weeks ago, and had a completely scarred cornea. It looked like his anterior chamber was flat. Throughout all this time, he was seeing Dr. Harry for kind of serial B scans just to look at the posterior pole, which looked normal. He dealt with some pressure issues because we could tell in the summer that he really didn't have much in the anterior chamber, but we were able to control him on topical therapy. Um, even during that time in the late spring, you know, things were looking pretty bad and, um, after his cornea transplant. So he actually, uh, he actually got uh, eye drops from Europe, a, a different type of Canthamoeba treatment that's not available in the U.S. called desmetadine, um, which is just another kind of chlorhexidine type antiseptic, antiseptic like hexanidine. Um, so we were fairly confident. We would do in the late in the fall. We were doing kind of these times where we would have him off steroid and let his eye get a little more inflamed, with the idea that when you um, take people off steroid, maybe the cysts kind of wake up and you, and that way you can kill more of the bug. And then we put him back on steroid and we slowly tapered him off of his pH and being chlorhexidine. Once he was off for about a month, things were looking good. We said we'd take him to the operating room. So this is our case. And just, it was a, we did general anesthesia, because you can see uh, we were probably doing a lot of work. You can't really see into the anterior chamber, but you'll see what it looks like when we take this cornea off. Um, but one of the first things we did is we kind of marked out the limbus because, you know, it's so scarred and we want to make sure that we send the graft well. Um, put on a fluorine because we knew that there was going to be an open eye for quite a while. <clears throat> and I think we, we used the 8 millimeter 
uh, tree find and then 825 uh, graft. So you can see we, we tried to go down 90% thickness and um, kind of perforate it a little bit. So one thing the anesthesia really helped us with is they had they hyperventilated him they um, to help with um, kind of paralyzation and also gave him um, medication so that he wouldn't buck at all during the surgery. But you can kind of appreciate here when we in, uh, inject viscoelastic that there's a lot of resistance and you can kind of see the cornea open up a little bit. And we did a really slow dissection of the cornea from the underlying iris. Um, and just this is sped up some, so you know this this case total took about two hours, um, and we weren't really sure. We couldn't really tell anything about his lens status when we had done his original cornea transplant. So this was actually fairly clear. Um, so just lots of dissection, and like I said, Dr. Mifflin was nice, slow, and methodical, and you can kind of appreciate there's a lot of fibrosis and scar tissue on the iris. It's distorted. Really, it was really hard to tell where his natural pupil was, and we thought it was right in this spot. But you can appreciate uh, that he does have this white lens too. So we basically tried to see if we could open up his pupil and expand his iris, see if we could, you know, do cataract surgery without uh, distorting or cutting it like we're doing right now. But well, ultimately, we had to cut it inferiorly, which is right there, and then also superiorly too. Um, there was about 30 minutes between the first cut and the next cut. But something else Dr. Mifflin did was he wanted to make sure that there was some space in the anterior chamber. And so we spent a lot of time kind of dissecting out to the angle with blunt Westcott's, which I skipped a lot of that because it took quite a while. But you can see he has this big white lens and Dr. Mifflin did an open sky um, cataract, uh, cataract extraction. So you need a vision balloon and made a, tried to, uh, suck out some of the cortex after making a small nick in the anterior capsule, which you'll see coming up here. And there really not, not much came out. Um, but it's really difficult to do open sky capsorexis because there's really, you know, there's no viscoelastic keeping the anterior capsule flat. It tends to want to go out. Um, and it looks like it's kind of going out here, but we were able to do a uh, continuous curvilinear capsorexis. And we could actually, uh, once the lens was prolapsed out, you could actually, during, under the scope, you could actually see the inferior edge of the capsorexis. So it kind of helped us stay oriented as we um, did this part and also uh, removal of cortex. But when it's open sky, the lens typically comes out pretty easy, and you know it's pretty rewarding watching this come out. So um, we were really careful at the end because we didn't know if it's still attached to the posterior capsule. It wasn't. But um, at this point, you can do there are different ways. You can use bimanual INA. You can use a Simco if you have one available. Um, but we tried to get as much cortex as we could gently, and then. Viscoelastic and put a three-piece MA60 in the in the capsular bag, which is also difficult to do when it's open sky. Um, Thing that I won't show here, um, but we had already cut the the donor tissue at this time because we really wanted to decrease the amount of time that the eye was actually open. Um, but here we did some. We tried to make a, a pupil and ended up with about a uh, two, probably three millimeter opening. Um, but just used nanoproline sutures to kind of close the two ends. Mainly because part of the reason why is because we, you know, if he was going to have some vision potential, we wanted him not to have crazy glare, but also we wanted to keep the lens uh, in the back in the posterior chamber.
yeah, so that's kind of what it looked like. You can kind of see the pupillary aperture here. And then just did like a standard penetrating keratoplasty. Um, we used 16 interrupted sutures. He had a little suture leak <coughs> superiorly at the end of the case that we checked before mm -hmm. seeing. And so we actually put him in a bandaged contact lens, um, but took it off at week one. So I'll kind of just skip and you can kind of see the. I showed the four cardinal sutures, but his eye didn't really leak after putting in the first four sutures and kind of a little less stressful at that time because the eye wasn't open anymore. Um, but you can kind of see here, this is intraoperatively what he ended up looking like. His, his chamber was deep and we tried to get as much viscoelastic as we could. And then we patched him overnight and um, he went, he, was, he was, had been light perception for the last few weeks, but there was no uh, relative afferent pupillary defect by reverse. So at about, this is two weeks post-op right here, and he, he was cow fingers. We were able to look at his nerve and see that he had, didn't really have any pallor, um, and his macula was, you know, kind of gross, grossly normal. Um, but it just kind of shows that what the damage this can do. We know there, there are reported cases where, you know, people have lost their eye because the, the canthidium has spread to the sclera. And luckily, we haven't had a case like that, but we have had some bad <coughs> cases where it's gotten into the eye, eaten up the lens and uh, cause tysis, but we're hoping that he can make a good recovery. Um, he's, his big issue, we're kind of concerned that his pressure may be an issue because his chamber is so flat for so long. And so we just don't know ultimately what, how that's going to end up, but we just want to show the case because it was interesting. It took a long time, for, you know, probably the longest cornea case we've done in a while, um, but just slow, methodical, um, uh, the section of all the scar tissue, I think, really helped us in also getting anesthesia on board to really discuss the importance of helping uh, decrease the risk for expulsion. So. If you know any questions, I can take those.